Stephen Parnes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, Madam Deputy. Um, may I? Apologise, um, because there's been so much Northern Irish business in the last week that I've made my farewell speech 15 times. Um, I am known as the Dame Nelly Melba um, of, of West London, um, but may I say that if anybody wishes to say any nice things about me, please, please don't let them be constrained by the fact that it's already been said a few times before. I leave this house with great sadness. I have to say what tipped me over the edge was a, a text message from the Argyle Surgery in my constituency inviting me to attend an end-of-life seminar. Um, <laughs> And I thought to myself, maybe, maybe my time has come. But I have to say, listening to honourable and right honourable members describe these glittering careers, this great cavalcade, this great cornucopia of achievement, I look back on my years in this house with a, a certain sadness. <laughs> as I came into the house as a Blair babe in 1997, <laughs> I was immediately appointed to the Broadcasting Committee, along with the honourable member for North Thanet. He and I then decided to set ourselves the, cast, the task of actually ending broadcasting of the House of Commons. <laughs> I was swiftly removed from the Broadcasting Committee. The Honourable Gentleman North Thanet was knighted. I make no comment. I was then PPS uh, to an Honourable Member for East Ham, who was uh, a marvellous man. Unfortunately, I then chose to vote against my government on the issue of part privatisation of the NHS and had to step down. I, however, was rescued from ignominy and, and the outer darkness and made PPS to Hazel Blears, an amazing, wonderful woman. <coughs> Sadly, I had to vote against the government on the issue of <laughs> Trident Renewal. And sadly fell once more again into silence and disuity. However, in those days, Tony Blair, a man of sound Christian principles, knew that God loves a sinner who repents. <laughs> and he gave me another chance. The fact that every time I appear in the chamber, my whip has to sit next to me. <laughs> it is sadly a fact that not everybody believes me. And I was appointed PPS to then on member for Tooting in the Transport Department. Sadly, <laughs> HS2 was then going to be run through my constituents like a great steel snake slamming through the suburbs. And I felt it necessary for me to resign. <laughs> I quite clearly have achieved very, very little, but <laughs> one thing I have achieved is a knowledge and understanding of this place and a recognition that structure is a function of purpose. And it is so easy to be intoxicated by the beauty of this place. I remember when I first came in here, um, Tony Blair set up a thing called the Modernisation of the House Committee, because, frankly, most of us needed modernising. <laughs> After a few months, the Modernisation of the House Committee had gone completely native. <laughs> uh, and we'd said, no, this is the way things have always been done. So he had to set up a modernisation of the Modernisation of the House Committee. <laughs> committee. And after four weeks, we reported. We had created, we had installed, we had brought a tights machine to the corridor just outside Annie's bar. Designed by men. What else could we possibly do? But I think of this building as really the corporeal embodiment of the ship of state. This is a great glorious galleon sailing, sailing across storm-tossed oceans. We have the sketch writers up in the rigging, we have you know, Crace and Letts and people like that up there in, in, the, in the rigging. We have the galley downstairs with our marvellous cooks who actually bring a steak and kidney pudding and duff on a regular basis. And what hasn't been mentioned, I have to say in the tribute to all the house staff, I mean the doorkeepers, wonderful people. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. the, the, the library, amazing people. I must visit it one day. <laughs> <laughs> The admissions order office, if they need to tell me where it was, I'd go there. <laughs> uh, and so many of the other incredible things, but the, the bar has not been mentioned. <laughs> and in my day, there was more than one. But the strangest bar, what more welcoming sight could there be than that cheerful face behind the bar and that cheerful comment, the usual, Mr. Bar? <laughs> but not all at once, I trust. But it, it is wonderful. We have, of course, we have a firm hand on the wheel. And it's marvellous to see um, Madam Deputy Speaker. I had the captain, of course, for most of my parliamentary career, uh, was Tony Blair, who I mentioned. It. And Tony Blair had a slightly tempestuous relationship with the first mate, or the, the purser, the man responsible for the purse strings. Um, <laughs> it, it wasn't so much like sort of Aubrey and Maturin. It was more like uh, sort of Captain Bly and Fletcher <laughs> Christian, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but uh, not implying that the great um, Anthony Charles Linton Blair was anything like Captain Bly. But... but <laughs> this great ship of state will be docking in another berth before too long. And I like to think that people realise that what's important about this place is not the gorgeous neo-Gothic surrounds, it's not the, the Pugin beauty, the wonder of the place. It's what happens here. 
and it's the people within it. And I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't know a single person who's come into this House with ignoble motives. I don't know anyone who's come into this House not wishing to make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In many ways, we've failed to actually get that message across. But if anyone had been here early on for the debate on the historical yes. institutional abuse yes. in Northern Ireland, they will realise that this place is a powerhouse. It is a place where major change can take place. And if we don't do it, then who does? If we don't give that political lead, then who does? If we do not set that standard, and if we do not seek to protect our nation, then who will do it? As far as I'm concerned, the miracle of this place is how much we do achieve. The tragedy of this place is how little we make that case. I could not have survived all these long, lonely years out of office um, without the team in my office. And I'd like to particularly thank Susan McLeod, Sue McLeod and Diane Wall, who between them have been here for the whole of my time. I'd also like to thank my wife, who's been sitting in the undergallery for four and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> but above all, I'd like to thank my fellow parliamentarians. I've made friends across the political divide. The Honourable Gentleman for Strangford, I've actually spoken at his fundraiser in the Arts Peninsula. <laughs> <laughs> and even, even when I was making my speech to the Strangford Democratic Unionist Party, he wanted to intervene on it. And on that particular occasion, I said, is there anything to drink? And he said, yes, orange juice. <laughs> and I said, any particular story? He said, better orange juice. <laughs> I have, and the honourable gentleman, the member for um, the Ribble Valley, with whom I bonded in Hong Kong. Uh, there, are, <laughs> there are people on both sides, and they've taught me one thing. It really isn't the colour of the rosette that we wear that matters. It really isn't the flag, the, the mast to which we nail our flag. It's what's within us. It's what's within our hearts. And that decency and that honesty that I see all around me in this place is something that makes me bitterly regret that I will be leaving you. But it makes me immensely proud of the fact that even for a short time, for 22 years, I have been a member of the finest legislature one could ever imagine peopled by some of the finest persons and the finest personages. I'd like to thank every one of you, and I'd like to thank my constituents in Ealing North and this House for being such a marvellous Parliament for all the people. Yeah. Yeah.